Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week. In partnership with The Daily Beast, we say hello to Aaron Zaleski. Welcome back as well to Judah Grunstein of uh, World Politics Review, uh, Dove Alphon of the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz, and uh, Emery Demir, former editor-in-chief of uh, the French edition of Zaman. Now, uh, we were talking uh, before the break about uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu being at odds with his own security apparatus. How about a certain Donald J. Trump, who's been feuding this week with his uh, services over Russian hacking, even quoting WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in a tweet, Trump telling the New York Times ahead of his briefing by the CIA and FBI uh, that uh, he uh, believes, yes, there was hacking, but seems to believe that it's more China than Russia uh, that's to blame. Um, for his part, the Republican head of the Senate Armed Services Committee calls the hacking real and adds it's an act of war on the part of Moscow. Judah Grunstein, can you believe what's happening two weeks from Inauguration Day? It's definitely surreal and hard to believe, especially with a Republican president. The thing is, with, with Donald Trump, uh, something that occurred to me today, actually, uh, he fired off also a, a series of posts on Twitter attacking Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, is, who replaced him as the host on Celebrity Apprentice. And it's understandable to the extent that Schwarzenegger publicly disavowed Trump during the Republican uh, primaries and also during the general election. Uh, it's a little less understandable because Trump is actually still an executive producer of the show and has a, a stake in its success. So he's actually attacking the star of his own show. And, it, and what occurred to me was that, uh, that for Trump, uh, he, whether it's instinctive this... by nature or calculated, mm -hmm. he understands, I think it's, I think it might even be a mix of both. He understands that a fight gets attention. Uh, he was a guest star on professional wrestling uh, several times. Uh, he knows from the media, talk shows, when they devolve into uh, basically arguments, they get the, 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 the clicks. Uh, and so he, he conducts politics by confrontation and politics by fights for now. It, it worked for him in the campaign. Uh, he just called uh, the, the Senate minority leader uh, a Democrat, Chuck Schumer from New York, who he knows personally because they're, they're both in the same political circles in New York. Uh, he called him a clown, which is just really unprecedented language for the president of the United States to speak about a senator, regardless of the, the most important uh, Democratic senator. It's this constant conflict, this constant fighting. It gets attention. It gets eyeballs. It's attractive to some people, especially because it breaks certain taboos and it's transgressive. And there are a lot of people who are resentful right now and they want to transgress. I don't think in terms of governing, it will be sustainable. And especially when we can get more into the issue of particularly Russia, even within his transition team, there are, uh, there are divisions over how to handle Russia. There are s severe, significant divisions between Trump's expressed views and the leadership in the Senate, especially the Republican leadership, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, who are both Russia hawks. So it's it, it, um, both in terms of the general approach and also the specific issue of Russia, I'm not convinced it's a sustainable uh, method or policy with regard to not, not convinced it's sustainable, no. but Aaron Zaleski, here we are talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Twitter feud and and I mean, he, it's, it's, he's got our attention. So he's definitely got our attention. And it's like Judah was saying, I mean, it, it is entertaining and you know, fights and conflict in terms of entertainment and entertainment value, uh, that, that does have value. But in a political context, I think it's really worrying. I mean, I, I was reading a, an article in the U.S. press today that said that Trump's Twitter feed is a security disaster waiting to happen because it's just so unfiltered. And he's already affected businesses with it, with his tweets about Toyota. Uh, it's very easily hacked. Anyone, I mean, not anyone, but there are, it's not too difficult to hack the, someone's the only, Twitter account. The only bright side might be that Twitter itself is facing some difficulties in terms of trying to be, <laughs> sell itself, and it might actually not survive. So that might actually be the let, solution. Let, let's pull up one of the tweets uh, from this week. Uh, this one came out uh, bright and early a few hours ago. The dishonest media does not report that any money spent on building the Great Wall, uh, capital G, capital W, you'll see, for sake of speed, will be paid back by Mexico later. 
Emery Demir, your reaction to that tweet? <laughs> well, I mean, this tweet diploma diplomacy and the, the Amer America First uh, policy creates certainly, I mean, will potentially create uh, an economical, economic and military disaster for uh, U.S. Uh, I mean, we've seen the same reaction from China. Uh, and hey, will it create a disaster? Because you just heard Judah Grunstein say he, he knows about communication and entertainment. He knows how to, you know... I don't. Well, I, that's not mutually exclusive. I, I'm kind of in agreement here. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, the national interests of the United States is not uh, independent from, you know, the U.S.-led global order. Uh, we live in a highly interconnected world. So if you pull out U.S. from you know, Europe's equation or from Latin America or from uh, Asia or from Middle East, that will create a lot of... Uh, uh, a big void for China, for Russia, for other powers, and it will create uh, an economic and also military instability for the world. And, and it's uh, frightening, to be honest, to for uh, for the rest of the world. It's also, right? I mean, these are serious allegations that, that yeah, Russia exactly. meddled in the U.S. election. That is a very serious allegation. And for a, a president-elect to kind of downplay it and shift the focus elsewhere, that's very worrisome. Uh, Move, move, it's really deflecting it to China. Mm -hmm. Now, what if somebody in the China apparatus decided that's enough with his joke and, uh, you know, devaluates the, the money from the, the, the morning after the inauguration? What then Donald Trump is going to tweet? Uh, this is a very dangerous situation. But also for us journalists, it's fascinating, hypnotizing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm in. Bring it on. Tr Trump's <laughs> tweeting the subject of much scorn two weeks again ahead of inauguration day. Grow up. Time to be an adult. You're president. You got to do something. Show us what you have. It's going to be much clearer what he's for and against and what we're for and against now that it's going to get down to actually discussing in detail these issues that affect people's lives. Is it that the circus will continue for two more weeks and then things will be different? Well, there, there's this, this sort of debate. Uh, is, is it all part of some crazy master plan and it's just, just communication? Uh, for instance, this idea that uh, sort of a, a reverse Nixon, where, where Nixon uh, organized detente with or, or normalized relations with China to split it off of the Soviet Union and therefore win the, the Cold War. Uh, Trump might be trying to split Russia off from China, make China the adversary, team up with Russia and therefore contain China and Asia. That's maybe what his China advisors and his Asia advisors have in mind. The, 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 the big problem with, with Trump that I, that I see is twofold. First of all, it, it does get, I, it, it get, it gets eyeballs, it gets clicks, it gets coverage. Uh, we're, we're covering someone's social media feed as if it's a beat. Uh, at the same time, it's very, very tiring. Uh, Erdogan survives in Turkey because he has arrested tens of thousands of people. The same thing with Putin in Russia. Uh, th that, kind of, that kind of politics gets very, very tiring, and especially because a lot of the policies that he's talking about will have very negative uh, consequences economically for his core political base. Uh, the kinds of trade wars that he, that he risks setting off uh, Mexico, the, the trade with Mexico, something like 40% of Mexico's products that are imported by the U.S., 40% of the components are made in America, uh, and they're assembled there. So in other words, when you cut off trade to Mexico, you're cutting off trade from the U.S. to Mexico also. There will be sectors that might benefit, maybe, uh, but there will be other sectors that, that mm. lose. So between the fact that it's incredibly tiring, between the fact that he's, he risks getting into conflicts with his own political party in Congress, that his policies, if he enacts them, will have negative consequences on his base, I, I, I suspect that the honeymoon will be very, very short-lived um, and that there will be a real sense of alarm in Washington, a question of, waiting to figure out what goes too far. And if it goes too far, uh, I, I do believe that the, the checks and balances within the, the U.S. government the system will work, will yeah, work. That, that, that he'll be impeached. High expectations, uh, Judas was mentioning it from Donald Trump's voters when it comes to what happens after Inauguration Day. High expectations from Brexiteers when it comes to what happens 
uh, after March 31st when they uh, launched those formal moves to pull out. This week, Theresa May had to manage those expectations with the replacement of her ambassador to the European Union, Ivan Rogers, who resigned uh, what he, over what he called muddled thinking and a lack of strategy ahead of negotiations, uh, again, due to officially start at the end of March. The Economist in a, an editorial dubbing her Theresa Maybe. Uh, and the, the uh, newspaper there saying after six months, what the new prime minister stands for is still unclear, perhaps even to her of Alphonse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit cool, but uh, she's in an impossible situation, let's face it. I don't think it's her personality. I don't think she's indecisive. There's nothing to decide about. She has no choice but to uh, somehow gain time because this entire Brexit was really forced upon the, the, the political circles in Britain. No, there's no precedent. Nobody knows what to do. And uh, one of, for example, Germany could one day say, no, two years, this plan of yours of two years, we're not buying it. We want six months. We want three months. And, and France is an election year. Uh, you know, they could say, no, in, in uh, 30 days, you leave the union and that's it. So, so I think she's playing time, like all the politicians we mentioned today. And uh, the time maybe is running out. Well, I mean, this, Theresa May's uh, secret Brexit strategy reminds me uh, Trump's, Donald Trump's uh, secret plan to defeat yeah. ISIS in he one month. It's so secretive that maybe she doesn't know what it is. Uh, I mean, uh, but at this stage, I think we need clarity. Uh, and uh, before, before, before the end of March. The, I mean, right. yeah. we, when you look ahead, uh, there will be elections in France, in Germany, in Netherlands. So I think we need clarity. And we both, everyone knows that uh, they didn't, the Brexiters, at least, they didn't have any, any kind of strategy after the referendum. Right. All right, before we go, we've seen the future. And it serves a mean latte. <laughs> yes, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas featuring the latest in artificial intelligence, including the coffee-making robot made by Beijing-based Bubble Lab. It's got a little heart there in the foam. Should we be cheering, Erin Zaleski, or should we be frightened? Oh, I, I think it's very charming, um, actually. Um, I'm also really gentle. Not if you're so, a, <laughs> so maybe not if you're a waiter in a in a cafe, though, That's right? That's true. I mean, I think in the, in the short term. I, I don't think it's something to be concerned about. But yes, in the, in the long run, there could be. I mean, it wasn't just the coffee making ones. I saw there was one that folds your laundry for you, and then they have household help robots that sort of take care of. I mean, that's the cutting edge in terms of domestic services. But right. in terms of an industry, on a more serious note, a lot of the jobs that uh, have been lost right. in America that drove voters to Donald Trump exactly. were lost not to China and not to, to Mexico, but to automation to and, and in, uh and robots. So that kind of technical change is stuff that you can't really stop. You can't uh, legislate against. Uh, and it just it, it is, some, is, a, is a blind spot in terms of the message that yeah. Trump's been sending yeah. to his uh, to his absolutely, and it's civilian and military. What with the yeah. uh, talk that uh, yeah. robots are going to replace soldiers. Yeah, well, that's maybe a good thing from all the <laughs> from all the other things. But Automation. but seriously, when when we dreamt as as children that one day robots will work mm -hmm. instead of us, uh, where, where would our salary come from? Nobody thought of it, and and, and it's happening, and nobody is really prepared. It, it, if I may, just uh, uh, on the on the Economist, respect where respect is due. Teresa maybe is just a brilliant headline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you forget killer drones. By the way, uh, a French startup has come up with a killer toothbrush. The technology has captured data on millions of different brushes that people have had over three years. That way, it knows just where to go. And it tells you if you are the right place in your mouth or in the wrong place. Emery Demir, are you ready to spend $129? Do we really need this? I mean, <laughs> it's not that hard to. to uh, well, a personal note, maybe, uh, about the virtual reality. I mean, the, the event has been uh, huge for the VR. 
uh, and we know that that it's the next big thing. Uh, and uh, the, the the problem with the VR, the virtual reality, reality that uh, everybody knows it, but few experienced it. So it has been a huge, huge event for the VR. I think that it will be a disruptive technology, such as the smartphones. Uh, the last decade was the, uh, the decade of smartphones, and we will have a, a decade of uh, disruptive technology from the virtual reality. D d disruptive technology, and technology is already disruptive. Aaron Zaleski, there's a French politics angle to all of this. Uh, the, the, one of the leading candidates for president, François Fillon, is at the CES in Las Vegas. The uh, French digital affairs minister is there touting uh, fr French wares. All this happening, though, the week uh, th that uh, French law began giving citizens the right to disconnect from their office duties right. uh, when they get home from work to not check their s emails on their smartphones and, and, and on their computers. What are uh, your thoughts on that? It is a bit ironic because on the one hand, you know, the, the French uh, presidential candidates are you know, aligning with other world leaders and saying technology is the way forward and there's a lot of new startups in France. But I think you can't really change overnight the, the basic uh, the value of work-life balance that, that permeates French society. I think that, that, that would take longer to sort of change that consciousness. That disruption so of, of, right. of work-life balance, Dove Alphon, we haven't come to grips with it yet. No, but France is really in the, in the right spot to do it because uh, there's a general consensus that uh, in France, even from the right wing, of, uh, uh, exactly. and this is why I think France will lead the way in new laws that maybe some countries will copy. You know, even to, immediately after the new law on January 2, big companies decided that email sent by managers after 7 p.m. will be deleted from the server and won't reach the worker at home. <laughs> so these are concrete steps. It's I'll, not. It's, I'll it's, tell you, I have my own personal <laughs> technique. It's called the 2G phone. Uh, it doesn't receive dumb email. Phone. I have a dumb phone, <laughs> and I can. Uh, it's anecdotal, but over the course of say the last year or two, two years ago when I would take out my dumb phone, people would kind of mock me for it. Now when I take out my dumb phone, people kind of look longingly at it and remember the days when it was just for calling people and talking and hanging up. And I, I, it, I nicknamed it my office door, because when I sign off from work, I close the door and my dumb phone keeps it shut. Uh, Emery Demir, when your smartphone dies, when you've, the battery is gone, are you relieved or are you frazzled and going out of your mind? Well, I'm a tech addict, so I'm, I'm not really relieved. And this, it bothers uh, you. you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's so French that I'm not surprised with this measure, you know, and I, I was surprised uh, with the amazement of the U.S. media with this measure. But it's so French, I, I, it's so normal for the French people, this measure, so. All right, uh, one final point uh, that we should mention. Uh, 2017, beginning with what could be the beginning of the end of FM radio. As of January 11th, the northern Norwegian city of Bode on the Arctic Circle will be the first to shut down transmitters and switch to all digital broadcasting the rest of the country to follow. The rest of the planet will be watching closely, just as Dove Alphonse said, they'll be watching our right to disconnect in this country, or they'll be listening, if you will, to see if we can live without the FM. By the way, here in France, it's only at the end of last week that flagship public radio station France Inter pulled the plug on longwave radio. By the same token, it's 8 p.m. shipping forecast. I see you shaking your head, Judah. It's a sad day for me because my childhood dream was always to be a radio disc jockey. But so there'll still be radio. It just won't be on out. FM. That's all. And it's not the same. The idea, the, the, there's something very romantic about the idea of a, someone in a booth far away with a transmitter and the waves actually making their way across the city. Uh, I grew up uh, at a time where to to hear good music, you had to stay up till about midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock for the college FM stations at the edges of the dial. And, uh, and yeah, maybe it'll be on digital. Maybe, maybe that makes up for it. But I, I, like, the, uh, I like the feel of, a, of a, a record jacket in my hand. 
Uh, I like the idea of radio waves actually making through. But then again, I have a dumb phone, so. The <laughs> <laughs> valve phone? Well, we are all romantic and nostalgic, for example, about vinyl records, right? Uh, we continue to buy them, and, and there's a revival in it. So maybe one day, FM radios will come back. That's but for possible. that, they first have to disappear. And uh, also, Scandinavia <laughs> is leading the way. I think that here in France and in Germany and in, in other parts, of, and, and in Italy, with a very strong on FM radios, it's not for tomorrow at all. All right, not for tomorrow at all, but what is for right now is our Media Watch segment of Alphon, uh, Aaron Zaleski, Emre Demir, Judah Grunstein. Stay with us. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. So uh, we're, we're worried about the death of the uh, FM radio dial. What's been on your radar? <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly, it's the British Broadcasting Corporation, which has really kicked off 2017 with something of a comedic controversy. There's giggling going on already. I think a lot of people already know about this one. Um, it's a sketch show called Revolting, which actually aired on Tuesday night, but the furore over this has really built throughout the week. It's um, called Catch Up TV, I guess. Absolutely. Well, BBC Two posted a particular sketch, and it's this one that's got all the attention, on its Facebook page. And here alone, it's had 23 million views, uh, which gives you an idea how much people are talking about this and sharing it. Uh, and what this particular sketch does is it mocks reality television, it mocks extremists, and it mocks the gullible who were taken in by them. Let's take a look at this little extract. Coming up this season on The Real Housewives of Isis. It's only three days till we're beheading, and I've got no idea what I'm going to wear. Abdul seduced me online. He had me at free healthcare. So this is my sixth marriage. Uh, I've been widowed five times. Six times. I'm so glad I've moved over here. It's everything those guys on the chat rooms told me it would be, and it's full of so many wonderful surprises. You didn't have to do this at first. Are you ready, girls? Yeah. Hang on, I'm recording it for Instagram. Ta-da! What do you think? Oh, I'm surprised me with it yesterday. Hashtag OMG, hashtag Jihadi Jane, hashtag death to the West Isis emojis. Oh, babes, I love it. You look gorgeous. She looked massive. You're gonna need a lot of Semtex to kill that one. Oh, guys. So as you can see, that is really a satire on everything in modern life. Apparently. But the British have such a good sense of humour. There was sense of humour failure in Britain, is that what you're saying? There's been quite a bit of sense of humour failure. Not just that, it really has had a very mixed response. Um, taking a look at some of the tweets out there. So the BBC is spoofing ISIS by recreating a funny version. Thoughts? Because I'm disgusted, said that Twitter user. Uh, another one here, the BBC really made a satirical show called The Real Housewives of ISIS, while the real housewives of ISIS are being raped and abused used daily. Um, also, another re reaction on Facebook, a fairly lengthy post here, where this uh, Facebook user says, the, the name of the programme expresses exactly how I feel when a religion I practice is being lampooned. And this tweet this person says it's going to fuel the rise of Islamophobia. But not everyone feels like that. Uh, it has to be said, lots of people really like it. Can't believe the BBC would produce such hilariously un-PC sketch, meaning uh, politically correct, obviously, or not politically correct in this case. Um, good news, funny, pungent, possibly even an effective weapon against ISIS. And there's a really interesting article uh, in The Independent written by Sonny Hundal, uh, in which he says that the outrage is ridiculous, it is our duty to poke fun at these people. He goes on to say he can understand why it's being criticised, um, especially at a time when Muslims in Britain in particular are facing growing problems with dogma and, and stigma and racism. Um, but, he says, the case for uncomfortable satire like this is far, far stronger. He says, we underestimate the power of humour. Laughing at ourselves isn't just a way to break down barriers, according to him. It also means to challenge fundamentalists. Dov Alphon, do shows like this divide people or bring them together? Um, I thought it's first of all a satire against the really the real housewives off, etc. So, so it's, a, it's an internal thing, reality television and the BBC is poking fun. But of course it has influence on, on Muslims and 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 and, uh, and it, it's it's really borderline. But I, I like the British because they, they really go all the way. <laughs> I think also for me what was very clear was part of the satire is to show the similarities in terms of the superficial 
uh, reasons that people are drawn to to uh, to ISIS in some ways the the being misled uh, and some of the similarities in terms of uh, that that kind of clannish uh, following of a trend and uh, and of uh, in fashion on one ha one hand and uh, extremist uh, fanatical uh, ideology on the other. Emery Demir. Well, I have mixed feelings about this. I mean, I, I find it a, a little bit borderline. Maybe, but maybe in 10 years, we will find this funny, uh, but <laughs> might, might be still early. Aaron? Yeah, mixed feelings as well. I mean, I, I agree with everything Judah said, but then on the other hand, I mean, there are people who have lost people close to them in ISIS-related terrorist attacks and maybe wouldn't find that yeah. as amusing. Yes, the writers themselves have been obviously giving their reactions um, to the fact that it has caused up so much controversy. And as you can see here, they say the worse things get, the more there is to satirise. And I think possibly they have a point. All right, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for being with us here in the world this week.